The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly ointment of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to take what was put into it. Jesus said, Let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Sunday in Lent, we enter into the last full week of our Lenten observance of penitence and pilgrimage. We look back on how it has gone for us, and we look forward to our destination, the cross and resurrection. On the Sunday of what will be the last day of his last week of his life, Jesus comes to Bethany, a little town on the slopes of Mount Olivet, less than two miles along the Jericho Road from Jerusalem. He goes to the house of his friend Lazarus and Lazarus sisters, Martha and Mary. He has been welcomed as an honored guest in this house before, but perhaps never quite as honored as on this occasion. For this supper may very well be a celebration of what happened in chapter 11 of John's Gospel, which was the raising of Lazarus. To give a supper for him. Martha serves, of course. Her <laughs> diaconine uh, is the word from which we get the word deacon. She is serving, just as deacons serve. Lazarus is enjoying table fellowship with Jesus. Great thing. Mary engages in an extraordinary act of worship. She anoints Jesus' feet with her with precious ointment and wipes his feet with her hair. Let us ask the classic Lutheran question, what does this mean? <laughs> this ointment is extraordinarily valuable. It's spike nard. It's imported all the way from India on caravans going all the way across from India to the Holy Land. Very expensive. But she doesn't anoint his head like prophets, priests, and kings are anointed, or like you would welcome an honored guest. She anoints his feet because the preparation of a body for burial begins with feet and moves on. She wipes 
his feet with her hair. There are only two reasons why a first century woman would ever let down her hair. For intimacy or in mourning. Mary, who we know would rather sit at Jesus' feet and listen then rather to that than help her sister Martha with the serving. Mary has been listening. And Jesus is aware that she's been listening. When she is criticized, Jesus does not say, well, gosh, you know, after all, I raised her brother from the dead. She's showing me a little gratitude. It's not what he says at all. He says that this is already an adumbration, a foreshadowing, an anticipation of his burial, of his passion, his cross, his burial. Mary has been listening. She realizes the importance of what will happen not many days from this supper. St. Paul says it best. I regard everything else, even a bottle of extremely expensive perfume, even my, all my past devotional practices, everything as nothing in the light of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and being found in him. Having that righteousness in him that comes from God. Not whatever he has had in the past, but what he presses on in trust toward the goal, the destination, God's future. That's what Isaiah is talking about in the first reading when he says with classic prophetic overstatement, don't remember the things of the past. Well, okay, but then what he says not to remember is the exodus, <laughs> the formative event of, of Israel, that event which leads to the identification of God in the Old Testament. Who is God? for the people of Israel, the one who brought Israel out of Egypt. And that is so formative for all who believe in this God that it's formative for us too. The one reading which cannot be omitted from the Easter Vigil is the story of the Exodus. God leading his people out of bondage in Egypt into the freedom of the promised land why would Isaiah say, uh, you don't have to think about that? As I said, it is a prophetic overstatement. He doesn't really want God's people to forget about that. Any more than St. Paul wants us to forget about our formative event, the cross and resurrection of Christ, whereby we, who are baptized into that cross and resurrection, are also made children of this God. We do cling to the formative events in the past that have made us who we are. But what Isaiah is saying, and what St. Paul is saying, and what Mary's gesture of extraordinary worship is saying to us, is that the past is but prelude to the future. Sure, we cling to what God has done in the past. But do we expect Him to act in our lives now? Do we press on in trust, in faith, press on towards the goal that has been promised? our destination, being found in Christ with the righteousness that comes from God. 
Or are we like our secular neighbors who say, sure, I believe in God, but I don't think he does anything. Do you expect him to act in your life now? You don't know what form that action will take because it's God's future, not ours. Our prayers are not a recitation of things that God already knows and our instructions about what to do about it. Our prayers are that he might remember us when he comes in his kingdom that his kingdom which comes of itself might come also to us. This little vignette in Bethany is a turning point in John's Gospel. The raising of Lazarus is the last of the seven signs of the Book of Signs, the first part of John's Gospel. And before the end of this twelfth chapter, Jesus will announce that his hour has come. Up until now, we've heard time and time again, his hour had not yet come. In this chapter, he will announce his hour has come, the hour of his lifting up on the cross and in glory. That's his destination and ours too. Paul says, I, I want to know the suffering of Jesus and be a part of that so that I can attain to the power of his resurrection. When we pray that God will act in our lives, we are not praying that he will make everything nice and smooth and wonderful for us. We are praying that he will always be with us, whatever we have to deal with. Like the Israelites on their way out of here like Jesus on the way to the cross. And like us. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings so that I might to attain to the resurrection. The destination of our Lenten journey is not far now. It is an adumbration, a foreshadowing, an anticipation of the destination of our lives. And we press on in trust, in faith, that God is not done with our lives yet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.